Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Scalable Data Science from Atlantis. So apparently Atlantis is uh, where we are, right? The part of the world that never sank. So I'm uh, Raz. I'm an Indian American Kiwi. And um, I, uh, I've been in, based in New Zealand for the last decade. And um, this is sort of a, a re rerun of this course. Uh, that was done in New Zealand uh, with recommendations from the industry there. And we are trying to do this with recommendations from Stockholm's industry um, uh, in Uppsala. So there will come a point where uh, we will sort of have a chance to introduce uh, one another. Um, before that, let me sort of give you some background. So we will um, have our uh, sort of logistics through the meetup. And all the discussions here are live, so uh, they're live streaming in YouTube. So if you have problems with uh, your face in YouTube, then maybe wear a mask or something, or sit somewhere <laughs> away. Um, Which is these seats. <laughs> we are safe, so. Okay, yeah, so, so I, yes. I show the ghost base place, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's just um, to, because there are some people who will be um, wanting to take this later. Actually, quite a few students cannot be here, most of PhD students. So we want to allow for the possibility for them to take the course because there are going to be assignments you're supposed to be doing uh, to achieve the certificate of completion. And uh, every lecture will be very important to the course project you will be presenting uh, and doing at the end of the course, which will be uh, the second course, which will be the second week of January 2018. Okay. Uh, so this way we can kind of feel people that cannot be here. There are a couple people from industry who will do this late at night, things like that. Is that okay? All right, so uh, all the meetings are going to be in this room except two of them. One is going to be in the uh, um, um, Berling room, at, which is downstairs, and another meeting will be in the ITC in Pollock Park. And the meetup has been updated for the, those two uh, different venues. So the default is just meeting here. Okay, so I basically went to the site from this link here. So I'll just right click and open it. This is our sort of main point. Um, so as you see, um, this is SDS 1.6 from Middle Earth, this is the New Zealand course. It was based on Apache Spark, which you'll find out what it is, uh, version 1.6, and we're updating it to version 2.2 in this course. And I kind of want to do it dynamically. Uh, sort of jazz this up, so depending on what your goals are, what your backgrounds are, so that uh, I will make the material as it happens. Okay, so. Um, so anyway, so if you go to this, um, this is our main site, SDS 2.2, and um, for the Uppsala registered students who are supposed to be here, uh, there are two parts, Introduction of Data Science and Fundamentals of Data Science. Okay. Uh, each one is a 3 HP, um, and it's made up of uh, two meetings per week, and each meeting is like an hour and a half-ish. And the lab and lectures, as you will see, are completely fused, uh, essentially. Okay? So hopefully after the break today, we will get all of you guys um, on your laptops on the right place. So the lecture is the lab, and the lab is the lecture. So you'll be able to do things as I'm doing things. Um, Okay, so I should say a few words about support. The course is supported by uh, Databricks Academic Partners Program, which I've had for a while now. Uh, and Databricks is this uh, UC Berkeley startup founded by the creators of Apache Spark. Uh, very briefly, Apache Spark is a fast and general engine for large-scale uh, data processing okay, in commodity clusters. So um, it's also supported by AWS Web Services Educate, <coughs> And depending on how we progress, uh, Uppsala University is now an AWS Educate institution. So every student uh, is uh, technically able to get uh, free cloud computing credits of about 100 or 200 US dollars. We'll sort those out. So I'm going to try to use that uh, maybe as an as a opportunity for you, some of you to do projects directly in the AWS cloud. That's going to depend on your background and how quickly you learn Scala and SDT and things like this. 
but uh, every project doesn't have to be at that level. There can be interesting projects easily done on the sort of simpler uh, environment we will use for most of the course, which is this Databricks Community Edition, and we'll get into that later today. Okay, so the course is sort of uh, influenced heavily by Combiant AV, which is uh, the AI and Data Analytics Center of Excellence. Combiant AV is essentially an industrial joint venture between 21 large companies in Sweden and Finland, uh, including uh, the Wallenberg sphere of companies like SAP and SED and so on. Okay. Um, so we are kind of customizing the syllabus for the needs of, of, uh, of this conglomerate of companies, current needs. Okay, overview of data science courses. Uh, this is just some official information. We'll get into that in detail soon. Um, the only thing I guess I want to say is, um, that I haven't said already, is that the contents, study format, and form of examination are kind of set a little bit, but uh, so basically you will have maybe four assignments for the first course. They'll be fairly easy, so it's just to, and then we'll give you instructions on what to do. Uh, basically email it as an attachment to, to my Uppsala address with some right subject line, and uh, we will sort of do some tests and auto grade and send it back to you. So doing the assignment is just to make sure that uh, you're doing something. But of course, the more time you put into this, the deeper um, you, can, you can go. The other main thing is because our main goal here is to get you to analyze data as quickly as possible, we will not have time to go into uh, mathematics, into the details of computing, into algorithms. And, okay, so each of you has a very different background, and that's okay. So we're going to kind of fly fast, but there'll be plenty of pointers for uh, those with special things, the right background to go deeper as they like. Okay, so the second course is essentially a continuation of the first, it's just one course. Uh, I'm just calling the second one Fundamentals of Data Science. And here the main difference is we will go a little bit deeper, I'll do more interesting things perhaps, but uh, the main emphasis here is not assignments, but a course project. And the course project should be something you're very proud of in the end. Um, you know, you can show your potential employers, hopefully. You know, um, you can do it again just in this simple Databricks uh, layer, um, and we will integrate it. And in the end, uh, the idea would be to have a Git book, just like we did for the 1.6 version, um, all the contents of this course, and your projects as student chapters. So we are kind of ho hoping to co-author a Git book together. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, it's uh, not just me doing this. There is a team. There's uh, we said the two guys here. They're math uh, PhD students. Um, Dan and Tilo, and um, they will have a chance to say more about what they've been doing soon. Okay. Um, okay. So maybe let's um, let's just get into stuff now. Um, so. Here, what I have is um, uh, this sort of basics. So don't get scared if you don't know anything. We'll sort of make sure we can all be on the same page. So you need to have some idea of command lines and the little things we need. I'll introduce them. Uh, but here are some courses you can take for free, Udacity or uh, whatever. I sort of I think they're still free. Um, so. Um, you don't really need Git yet. Uh, let's see how things go, maybe for the second part. Um, and Scala, everything you will need to, the Scala knowledge you need for the course, we will start from scratch. So you don't need to worry about knowing Scala ahead of time. But we, this is not a course where you're, you know, you shouldn't be taking this course to learn Scala. Okay. And um, to be honest, I am currently <laughs> myself learning Scala. Um, you know, so. Here are my MOOCs I'm doing right now. And so I'm just like slightly ahead of you guys. So, And that's the whole point because, <laughs> you know, that's how it's going to be played in reality. And, and, and some of you will be able to go way deeper into something and that's good. And I want to learn from that. And that's how the game is played because one person simply cannot do everything. Um, oh yes, a very important thing, the course project 
it is mandatory to be done in groups of at least two. So if you cannot do a, a course project um, with another person, then you probably shouldn't take the second course. Uh, okay. Um, so unless you're like some pure math student or some hardcore committer or something, and you want to do something hardcore on your own, then we have we will have a talk. But uh, generally, it's assumed because I want you to be able to demonstrate your ability to work with someone else. Okay, so what else here? There's lots of other free courses, computer science. I mean, if you um, if you need to get into, but um, okay, let's get to infrastructure. <coughs> so here's um, some basic requirements for it. Uh, I'm going to do the absolute vanilla version, which is uh, the Databricks managed cluster in the cloud. So the cloud is just some big data center somewhere else. Uh, in fact, Amazon is going to Amazon Web Services is one of the big cloud providers. So they're going to build a data center in Stockholm quite soon. So there will, this data center will have to conform to Swedish jurisdiction within the European Union laws. So people operating on these clusters will have to abide by uh, a very nice system of laws, even if they are somewhere else in the world and running their code through the, the local. Uh, so that's good. That's very good for uh, Sweden, I think. Uh, the Databricks uh, shard, uh, which we will you know, sort of manage cluster in the cloud that we will be using, abstracts away all the complexities. You don't need to be you know, an engineer to figure out how to run these things on your own in AWS, where you set up your own machines and your own virtual private networks and all of that stuff. So it's all kind of done for you. So the community edition is free, but you know, if people want to use it in a more uh, professional setting, then you have to pay for it, of course. The other option, which you don't have to do, um, is um, getting your laptop ready for doing things in-house. So if you don't have any internet connection, for example, and for that, uh, we'll, we will see how, how things go. So we're trying, we have a big Docker image that you can dump. And the Docker image essentially is kind of like a modern virtual machine, basically. Um, and the Docker image will have uh, all the things you need and also uh, an open source, Apache open source version of a notebook called Zeppelin into the Databricks, which is closed source at the notebook level. Okay. So we, we, we will see how, how, um, how, how people feel about that. Um, but generally, all you need is a laptop with a, with a web browser to do this course. OK, so and then if people are really into it, you can get into building your own managed cluster. So these guys actually built a, a little cluster of three machines using what are called Intel Mucs, next units of computing, sitting on my desk. In fact, that's where we'll be grading your submitted homeworks, but you don't have to go there. And this guy here, he's actually from industry, from Combiont, he's a data engineer. So he taught those guys how to do it in the Uppsala Big Data Meetup in the winter. Okay, so. so this course is actually a con continuation of the Uppsala Big Data Meetup. OK, so what else? Local computer. So this is basically cloud full, um, you know, just using cloud. And the first thing you maybe want to do when I'm blabbering away is maybe, <coughs> maybe right click this link and um, get uh, an account in um, the community uh, edition of Databricks. Okay? So you have to uh, sign up. And that will send you an email. And so, does everyone have an account in this? Okay, so maybe. Um, and if you get stuck, no problem, we can help you with that. Um, so, once you have that, then all the content I'm looking at, I'm about to look at, will be yours to look at as well simultaneously. Okay. So this is the cloud-free thing I was talking about, but let's um, worry about that later. Uh, and content Zeppelin, I don't think we're going to go there right now, maybe in the future. So, so ignore that and maybe ignore that. Let's see. OK, so now let's just go into the actual material for today. Um, so this is actually uh, an importable Databricks notebook. OK, so you can. Um, uh, if people have 
have a community edition, then they can do the following. So I can right click this, just copy the link address, and then I can go to uh, my community edition. So I already have an account. I, I still have my map.canterbury in the South Island of New Zealand. I guess you guys have seen Lord of the Rings. That's my island. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is for the continent. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe it's worthwhile waiting for everyone to be here. Then we can just start screening. So should should we should we go try to follow to try to log in or something? Uh, if you want, I mean, you don't have to. But so, well, I, I don't have an account at uh, Canterbury. Yeah, so so not for the next two notebooks. It's just mostly me blabbering. Mm -hmm. But the third notebook, we'll start doing a lab right away on learning Scala, and so we can do that over the break as well. So, um, so just just let us know when we should. But have some of some of you have the stuff already, some accounts. I'll quickly show you what you need to do. You just go here uh, or go to your home. And then you just basically can say uh, uh, import. You know, you click this triangle here, say import, and then from URL, and then I just you know paste that URL I just copied from. So then you, it sort of will become yours. Um, okay, and so for the next two notebooks, zero 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 and zero zero one, it doesn't matter, but zero zero two, I believe, I. You need to start coding. Oh, you, you can't start coding. That's after the break. Yeah, yeah that's oh, right. Cool. It's after the breaks, right? But only a couple people don't have the account, so I thought we'd just do that. Okay, so let me. Um, let me do this. So very briefly, I am an academic, spent about 12 years in academia, a couple of postdocs, mostly maths, applied maths, stats, and about two years in full-time experience in industry, data industry. And I currently have a joint appointment uh, the math department here and the company. So here's some quick links. Um, I want to point out um, so my interests are kind of broad in research. I'm mainly saying this because I would like to get to know what your own research goals are for your PhD, especially, and so maybe we can try to do something meaningful. So, um, so mainly, uh, um, the publications by field can be grouped into many areas. One is computer arithmetic and computer data proofs and statistics and simulation. So this is sort of its own little club. Uh, and I'm very passionate about computational non-parametric statistics. So this is actually at the heart of a lot of machine learning. So I kind of brought these books to show you the, the full shebang. Um, so this thing here, um, I guess it's a, uh, it's a book by Luke DeVroy, La Laszlo Ibiofori, and Gabor Lugosi. It's called A Probabilistic Theory of Pattern Recognition. So it's kind of the I don't know, Bible of machine learning theory. Okay, so, and it sort of builds from a deeper work uh, at sort of mathematical statistical level called statistical learning theory by Vatnik. Vatnik was at Bell Labs, right, when he was doing these things. Anyway, I think so. So, anyway, this is kind of the mathematical foundations where sort of all of this is building on. Um, um, so, and then the more sort of applied, like get your hands dirty, but still applied math stats books are this one, the elements of statistical learning, data mining, inference, and prediction. I like this a lot. This is kind of a Stanford gang, Casey, Tipshirani, and Friedman. And uh, I would say my favorite book of this kind of coding algorithmic understanding, but mathematically precise with. Absolutely clean notation, no inconsistency from top to bottom I could detect yet. Is this one, Kevin P. Murphy's book? It's called Machine Learning, a Probabilistic Perspective. So these are kind of what you want in the back of your hood if you say, you know, because I will be going through linear regression route really fast. I'll just show you show you cartoons. But uh, if you want to, if you want to really get into it and you're more mathy background, then this is the right place to dive. And, and we can discuss those things. Uh, Offline. 
Uh, I just got into this area called data science, and this is basically the first Git book that we published. Uh, the New Zealand one. Um, hopefully, we'll get another book, at least 790 pages. The page number is kind of overrated, right? It should be only divided by two because this Git book puts a lot of white space. Um, and the other, so I, I guess I'm very interested in population genetics. I did my postdoc there. So if anyone is into genomics and things like that, that would be interesting. I'm also into statistical physics and uh, simulations. Uh, and uh, some of the technology we'll be using is ideal for um, analyzing, say, terabytes of output from simulations done on you know, either embarrassingly parallel simulations or uh, supercomputer-based PE type simulations. Because analyzing the output of these supercomputer jobs is actually a classic big data problem. I haven't done anything like that, but if you're into it, we can make sure the material is taught so that you can do such things. Um, yeah, so anyway, some civil engineering, mechanical engineering, some NLP. And currently, I'm really obsessed with uh, extremism, terrorism, and hate, and how they spread online, and recruitments, and sort of applied operations research, and live, live, de live detections, and things like this. Um, so anyway, that's uh, a bit about me. Okay, so of course, this is funded by the interfaculty course in the discipline domain of science and technology, and that's where Tilo and Dan are getting their money. So. Okay, what is scalable data science? One big picture, right? This is straight out of Wikipedia with some extra decorations. So the problem is the following. We have raw data being collected and the data is getting processed. It's cleaned and then models and algorithms are built. There is some interaction with the exploratory data analysis where you go in and dive deep either visually or somehow. And then you, 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 know, you refine the models and then you often go back and regenerate uh, new features or feature engineer and clean again, or actually go back to the source itself and start collecting, okay, we need actually a different kind of data. Um, and what's the, in the end, what are you doing? You're communicating, you're making visual reports to your managers or whatever, trying to show you can increase the efficiency of whatever system. And then you're building a product, a data product, uh, sort of a generic term, um, something that's tangible, which can, you know, make money basically. Right? So there's a lot of skills that come together in this data science process. And um, I'm not an expert in this. I'm sort of fascinated by it for the last couple of years. So I'm sort of trying to get good at it. Um, the core skills you need for exploratory data analysis, cleaning the data, processing, doing models and algorithms, all of these arrows is maths, stats, and computer science. Okay, sort of foundations, technical foundations you need. But that's not enough. The main other thing you need, almost um, third, is uh, domain expertise. So you need to know the domain that you want to make this product, uh, the value this product has been created. So it, you know, astronomy, bioinformatics, whatever, uh, business analysis, crime science, all sorts of things, machine mission, NLP, um, and so on. Right. So and then of course there's entrepreneurship. So all of this sort of come together and and um, and. Here's a, you know, and of course, this is a hotly debated issue, especially in academia. What is data science? So it's statistics, so it's computer science, so it's maths. Everyone says something. But, you know, this is um, some, some science paper or ACM paper. You can read about it. Basantar, um, um, you know, what he means by data science and prediction here, the key insights. So I think if you just click the paper, you should be able to see it. Sweep, so subscribe to ACM at Uppsala. So the key insights are data science is the study of the generalizable extraction of knowledge from data. Okay, generalizable is formalized by Lapine, right? It's generalizability of a model. Right? Um, you know, and you want to extract something because it's not something that's there. So you, it's like mining; you to do something to get it out. Um, and then a common epistemic, you know, requirement is assessing whether new knowledge is actionable for decision making. Right? That's in predictive power not just the ability to explain the past. We are not you know, doing some kind of historical uh, retrospection here. We actually need to be able to make decisions based on this uh, extracted knowledge. And then a data scientist requires an integrated skill set that spans mathematics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, statistics, databases, optimization, 
and most crucially, either directly or working with someone who has a deep understanding of the craft of problem formulation to engineer effective solutions. So uh, you can read this again, just to give another perspective. Uh, Jordan, um, this is a Berkeley gang. Um, they, they, they basically say something um, quite similar, okay? And this is a nice paper to read in science. It's called Autonomous Systems and Robotics. It's already a couple years old. Um, so I just put these embeds here and there, and a lot of times, um, you know, if you, if you want to just find out what this is, so if I just say show code, what I have here is a little function we'll see later. It's a Scala function, I call it frame it. And um, so I'm just displaying this Wikipedia entry on data science with the 500 width here, right? Why I'm doing this, I used to write books, I just gave up because, um, okay, so anyway, I decided Wikipedia, I'm not happy. So a lot, of, a lot of our content will be embedded like this, so if you want to get a deeper interesting, just jump in here and then start browsing inside. And here are the mechanics of browsing inside is I guess if I say go into the history, it'll still be embedded browsing and then I have to right click and go back. Then I'm, okay. This is... Or you just access the Wikipedia page yourself. Yeah, you can, but I, I like to keep my things. <laughs> this is too much to remember, right? But it's, yes, you can right click and open Wikipedia and private browser, whatever you want, all good. Okay, so, you know, read more about it and, you know, if you disagree, you can change what you think and community of people will disagree with you before they make it public and all this. Okay, we're standing on shoulders of giants, right? So what do I mean by that? I myself got into this field by taking these two courses, uh, Berkeley edX series, CS100 minus 1X and CS190 minus 1X. They're called Introduction to Big Data Using Apache Spark by Anthony A. Joseph or AJ, who's a transfer mm -hmm. professor at Berkeley, and Scalable Machine Learning by Amit Talwakar, who's a assistant professor at UC Los Angeles. So I was doing this while I was uh, in the industry for a year. So without these courses, I simply couldn't have, um, you know, been promoted to principal data scientist and start actually doing things because you need to code. And it's not just me, right? Andrew Nig, this famous guy, right? Coursera founder. Um, he's back. Uh, he's back to California now. Uh, he he says this, and in fact, he was working in Baidu for a while, and he says you need to work hard and clean the data at least one one day or whatever. It gives you so many hours to do the really dirty work. Otherwise, your mathematical insights don't even flow. Well, most people. Okay, so um, we are remixing heavily on those two courses, and those two courses are already available for free in Databricks. And I'm essentially going to give you a crash span of those two courses, vital videos to watch, and then things to watch later. And um, yeah, so we have 20 minutes until break. So um, this course is really good by Reza Zadeh. So let's see if I, yeah, so distributed algorithms and optimization. Um, it's a um, much deeper course. It's a good PhD course in the math department or um, mathematical engineering department. Whatever. So, um, um, so here are the books we are going to basically uh, Build on, so I learned Spark myself in this book. It's a little outdated now, um, but it's a very good idea. Um, these are already a little outdated because the, the API has evolved. Uh, and this is uh, a current book. It's just published recently. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle of this. And the book for this course is actually not published yet. This is the one. <laughs> So I, I just am reading, it's raw and unedited, I'm just reading it in, in O'Reilly right now. So, um, so, okay, but but don't worry, you don't need to buy any books. Um, I already told you about how you'll be assessed, uh, but sort of here are the details, if you want to read them. Now let's just watch a couple of videos, just to, um, so this is a brief history of data analysis. Um, Okay. 
provided studies that showed any link between smoking and cancer. Sorry. Um, this is a brief history of data analysis. In the 1930s, Fisher proposed the design of experiments along with the statistical test ANOVA and Fisher's exact test. He was also credited with a quotation, correlation does not imply causation. This is ironic given that Fisher was a lifelong pipe smoker and derided studies that showed any link between smoking and cancer. In the later 1930s, Deming proposed the idea of quality control using statistical sampling. Lund, in the 50s, proposed the idea of using indexing and information retrieval methods with text and data for the purposes of business intelligence. And Tukey, in 1977, wrote the book Exploratory Data Analysis. This led to the development of the S and S plus languages, along with a language you've perhaps heard of, R. Dresser is a modern business intelligence proponent. And in 1997, Mitchell wrote a machine learning book that is still a bestseller today. In 1996, two Stanford PhD graduate students wrote a prototype search engine, which ultimately led to Google. And Microsoft, in 2007, released a data-driven science ebook titled The Fourth Paradigm. Norvig proposed the unreasonable effectiveness of data. The idea that multiple small models and lots of data is much more effective than building very complex models. And The Economist, in 2010, published an issue titled The Data Deluge around the exponential growth in data volume. Okay. Yeah, I'm a South Indian, you know, so there's a lot of Tamil movies there. So. I speak English quite fast. It's just because my native language is in English. Um, yeah, just to warn you. Um, if I'm speaking too fast, then please tell me to slow down. <laughs> Um, so I am not going to watch this now, um, just because um, you guys can watch this. It's a really nice video about machine system log data, and um, um, and the summary is basically you know, something like there's um, lots of click streams is everywhere, and there's um, you know every person that's doing online activities are sort of basically captured somewhere. There's billing events, you know. Of bank transactions, everything is basically captured. Right? So um, there's a lot of user generated content, um, and there's other things like Wikipedia and uh, Library of Congress, of Twitter, and um, so uh, Hadron Collider, and so on. So it's actually a really good video to watch later to, to give you um, a pretty nice idea. And, and make sure when you watch the video, you sort of recollect these these concepts. So I don't want to play videos here. Um, okay. So um, this this one is quite good as well. It's uh, it's a nice little video about uh, data science, and we can just stare at this Venn diagram quickly. So it's sort of uh, it's the intersection of math and statistics knowledge, uh, domain expertise, and hacking skills. Um, and you know traditional research usually falls here between math, stats knowledge, and domain expertise. So just traditional physicist and so on. Machine learning falls here between sort of hacking skills and math, stats knowledge. And uh, this is kind of danger zone when you have domain expertise and hacking skills. This is basically the kids in, uh, you know, Estonia, wherever they were doing all the fake news scrolls and making money. That's good. <laughs> Keep the system in check. Okay, that's not what we're going to do here. Data science is kind of the intersection of all three. Okay, so um, this one tells you a bit about cloud computing. Um, basically, this is a nice video about you know million server data centers. So I think Google data centers are robots on bicycles that go and automatically replace broken hard drives and things like this. Right? So that's all abstracted away for us. We don't worry about it. But we do have to worry about what happens if one of those hard drives fails while our computation is running on the resources allocated to us, say on AWS that we're paying for. And this uh, Apache Spark system will take care of that uh, through this abstraction called a resilient distributed data set at the software level. So we will kind of watch some of those videos. Um, 
And this again is essentially about what a data scientist does. You acquire the data, you prep the data, you clean it, analyze it, and so on. So again, these are a good few minutes. Um, and I just added this one as a slightly different view on what a data scientist is from another person. It's a Udacity course, so it's a little bit more current, but it's almost the same. Okay. What should you be able to do at the end of this course? Okay, you should be able to understand the principles of fault tolerant scalable computing. Scalable means you can add more machines and scale out your computation, so you can analyze larger and larger volumes of data. Uh, so, you know, if you're Netflix, you have more customers, stream movies to them, if you're, um, you know, Spotify, you know, whatever sounds, and if you're 23 and Me and you're sort of making money by people's desire to know their ancestry, then you can analyze more and more genomes for the whole population and so on and so forth. So that's what Scalable is all about. Um, you should be able to do hands-on coding with real data. You should have an intuitive, not necessarily mathematical understanding of the ideas behind the technology and the methods, and we've, there'll be plenty of pointers to other resources so you can dive as deep as you like in the areas you like, depending on your background. Okay. Um, so more concretely, you'll be able to ETL is this word, extract, transform, load, but also interact, explore, and analyze the data. So this is fundamental process and it's iterative. So once you analyze it and explore, you may say, oh, maybe I have to do a different extract transform load operation or even go all the way down to changing the sensors. Right? So this is, um, uh, you should be able to do these things and you can do this on semi-structured data, which are like Apache web logs um, in, in this example, or you can, be, you can do this on um, structured data like Wikipedia click streams. So these are actually videos from uh, various Spark summits and things like this that are worth watching uh, later on if you have time. This one's really good on exploring Wikipedia click streams. We might actually do this, what you watch in the video, we should be able to do in, in the lectures coming down. Okay. Um, and you should be able to build scalable machine learning pipelines using uh, the recommended methods in these open source uh, Apache Spark. Right. And we should be able to do end to l industrial machine learning pipelines. That means, um, you know, with these skills, you should be able to go and work in the industry. And with other people who are more experienced, you will be immediately pluggable and uh, useful. Also useful, but you know, you can justify your salary. Okay. Um, so we can choose from the list of topics because this is a lot is going on. So we have to decide a little bit today um, uh, where we want to go. What are your interests, right? Because um, what we did last year um, are various things depending on people's interests. So we will definitely do supervised learning, regression classification. Unsupervised learning will probably at least do clustering. Uh, and we'll do a recommender system just because you need to know some elementary ways to play. Um, from that point on, we could go into streaming, structured streaming, which is when data is coming at you continuously. You want to actually start um, building a model and detecting um, something in the real world based on the model you built. And in fact, uh, I was late this morning when Tilo and Dan were here because I, I was watching this uh, latest uh, video from Spark Summit um, 2017, I think. So this is uh, Mate Zaharia, who's now back at Stanford. He's the CEO of Data, uh, CTO of Databricks, Chief Technical Officer. This one's quite cute because um, they're doing sort of two little things. One is deep learning, <laughs> and so they're using, um, um, you know, if you know what these swear words mean, uh, which is called transfer learning. So basically, Google builds these big image models, and you can somehow learn from what Google's algorithms learned without doing all the hard work yourself. And in this video, it's quite fun to watch. Um, they have like just a few images of James Bond's cars, and then using the Google's pre-trained model, you can kind of transfer its knowledge and train your classifier to identify cars. And then in the second part of the talk, they, they do streaming performance. And what they do is they take this you know, pre-trained model and then they stick it in and they're watching cars in Beijing or wherever it's out. There's, there's a James Bond car, there's a James Bond car. It's kind of cool. So anyway, uh, I haven't, I haven't gotten into the notebooks myself, but that would be kind of fun to do, for example. 
So the question is, what do you really want to do? So I think we have a few minutes before the break. Uh, we can. Um, so I thought we can maybe break out and people can quickly say, um, you know, who you are, um, what's your research interest or your field uh, study, or, or if you're an undergrad, then what are you trying to do or get out of this course? And then, so some example answers could be like, I'm Eric Erickson, I'm into population genomics, I want to learn distributed computing frameworks for analyzing genomes of entire populations for certain rare diseases, for example. Uh, P.P. Halgrim's daughter <laughs> from Iceland, whatever. Okay, so you can say something like that, and we'll start with our uh, main guys here. So, I'm Don Stengle. I'm a PhD student in mathematics, uh, doing research in dynamical systems. And what led me to sort of be in this project is basically, well, I, I'm sort of interested in bringing validated numerics into a distributed setting. So, distributed computing with say, interval arithmetic and stuff. And also see how I can sort of apply this to my dynamical systems research. So. And you're slowly sort of edging towards the end of your PhD. So you need to yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> can survive afterwards. Well, yeah. yeah, that's also true. <laughs> yeah, guy wants to make sure he can make money. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Tilda Wicklund. Uh, I'm also a PhD student here at the Mathematics Department, but I primarily work in statistics, though so, no, what I do is that most days is, I guess, more theoretical work, but I also have an interest in computing and programming. And I guess what I've spent most of my time for with this project until now is writing the auto grading software that will check, check your, your grades. <laughs> Do you want to go? Uh, okay, so I, I will be the third, not the last. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I'm not I'm not a PhD student. I have I have I have been in this role a couple of times already. Um, I have I have graduated at Victoria University in physical chemistry and um, also in Saint Petersburg uh, in, in in Russia. I have been working at the SLU. Uh, and uh, currently I am working at uh, Colbyn. Uh, which Ross uh, presented a bit today. Um, so we are um, trying to do good things in the uh, uh, Swedish and um, in the, at least Finnish industry uh, nowadays. So we're um, uh, constantly looking for uh, guys who are able to uh, learn, understand, and have interest in uh, industry and science cooperation. Thanks. Yeah, I should say Combiant is a direct sponsor of this course. The equipment is Combiant. <laughs> so, for example. Yeah, so maybe you want to go? Yeah, uh, my name is Casper Nelson. I'm a computer science master's student. So I'm taking this PhD course. Uh, yeah, I'm originally interested in the deep learning. So, I've a few courses on that as well. My name is Nadia Maradzi, so I'm at the simulation of the biology department. I'm mostly working on my main interest uh, using computers there. And yeah. I'm interested in like using machine learning to be able to like understand like the structure just based on data we collected a lot. Okay. But when you say finding new uh, drugs, or do you have like robotic platforms that are doing No, so I'm doing everything through like um, I'm doing molecular docking, which is like how that computer algorithm that try to find the best food for oh, them inside. Oh, right, right, right. So this is three dimensional so protein it's structure. Still right. for oh, okay. It's for three computer based, oh. so I don't do any experiment. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah. My name is Edgar Brahas. I am working in the um, solid state uh, physics uh, department, and I'm working more, mostly on electrochemistry. And semiconductors, and uh, I would like to. I'm, I'm here to, for to see what can I get to be useful for my for my project. For instance, the uh, acquisition of big sets of data, uh, managing of them, representation, like modeling, and I'm also interested in scalable computing. So who that? Who? No. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm yeah, just. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, that's me. we were in Swedish class yes. together. <laughs> my Swedish is really not good. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, my name is Dmitro. I'm a PhD student in evolutionary biology. I work with genomic data, primarily bioinformatics. But I think I do it in quite a simple way. So I hope that uh, this course will help me to expand my analysis and make something more complicated. Okay. And I do mostly like population genetic analysis and more empirical and real data in the genomes. Okay. So this is more like demographic parameter estimations or? Yeah, I do like sliding window approaches to estimate different statistics around the genomes. Okay. I can also do demographic reconstruction. Like signals of selective sweeps. And yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay. but like I don't write this software myself. I mostly use like created software. Yeah. I just do some small scripts to extract what I need. Yeah, we should. But, uh, uh, deep, I've been looking for something like, so there is stuff, uh, Adam's one spark package, but then there's another new one that sort of bookmarked it. We can kind of dig into that if you want. So that's sort of all packaged nicely for Spark to do fully distributed computing on this exact data set. So my name is uh, Evgen. I'm a PhD student in applied mathematics here and uh, I work on uh, modeling simulation and experimental design job development. And the reason why I'm taking this course, so there is a new trend in the pharmaceutical industry um, concerned about uh, wearable devices and uh, analyzing of the digital endpoint. And I think this refers to streaming. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm Dennis Mulbeer, I'm a PhD student at the uh, uh, Energy Science uh, Department, or group actually, also in the solid state physics uh, group part of it. Um, and I'm mainly uh, concerned with the forecasting of uh, solar power and also electricity consumption. So I'm mainly interested in the first two topics, but uh, also the uh, streaming as you mentioned, and uh, yeah, spatial temporal modeling. And is most of your data already structured? Like, you know, like columns are there? And... Preferably, yeah, but uh, not necessarily. Right, uh, I'm Gustav Bjarro. I'm from the computer science department. My sort of research topic is discrete optimization or combinatorial optimization, if you modify it. Uh, my interest here is both, I guess, learning methods, scalable computing, but also, I guess, Streaming graph processing could be nice oh, cool. going from this. Yes. this, this yeah. yeah. So how do you envision maybe using streaming graph graph processing? So st streaming is yes, the um, we can have. I mean, when you're solving problems, you can sort of you get data of your performance and you can, yeah. I mean, learning heuristics, for example, yeah. you can use streaming process. Graph processing would maybe be more just maybe analyzing the search afterwards if you know, okay. what happened. Because I plan to do some distributed vertex programming, you know, like Pregel type stuff. So you basically, your graph is so big. Okay, graph basically is nodes and edges, right? Some abstraction node could be whatever. Uh, and it has properties like be people or whatever. And edges could be directional, like this guy's connected to that guy. But then imagine a graph that's so big that it won't fit into one computer. So you sort of chew it, break it into pieces, and put some lock for the lots of computers. And then, you know, a vertex program basically is, vertices are told what to do to update their state, and then they can pass messages, messages to their neighbors. And the neighbors receive these messages, and they will use that to update their own state, right? So Google introduced this in Pregel for PageRank to rank the websites, right? Um, and we will do that, but I just got excited because uh, it will be nice to do streaming a vertex programming. And so we, we will definitely go there. and. Uh, Try that out. My name is Jose Liz. I'm, um, I'm a PhD student at Physics, Computation of Materials Theory. And um, my main interest is um, on, I have been working with BFT, is that's the functional theory, simulate the properties of different materials that can be, that can boost the, the production of hydrogen. So it would be interesting to, we, we have a project that we try to set the, to predict the structure of 
material side would be more efficient. Right. Uh, using the spectroscopy. And the perspective. Okay. And the spectroscopy data itself is in the order of gigabytes, terabytes, or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It can, yeah. So it cannot fit in one machine easily. No. Okay. We use like uh, cross chips, high performance yeah. computing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but you're doing high, high high performance computing to do your simulations as well. Yeah. Right? But then when you dump the output of those simulations. Then yeah, I'll actually yeah, I'll I'll give you an article later. So that's another natural use for big data because in the um, ACM um, article last year there was this really beautiful article about how these two computing communities in the association computing machinery computer science world are uh, kind of diverged. One is this big data people who distributed computing with commodity clusters, cheap hardware, and then the sort of high performance supercomputing guys and probably for departmental budget reasons kind of diverge. And so this article was all about how a lot of magic will happen when they come together and, and, and there's kind of marriage made in heaven. They really need each other. So, yeah. yeah my name is Juan. I'm a student in bioinformatics, master's student. And I also have a master's in financial mathematics. And I'm here mostly for curiosity yeah. and all the applications that this course can give in bioinformatics. Cool. Uh, my recommendation of a friend in company actually. Oh, okay, that's good. So you you're the guy who also started a company, right? You emailed me or something. Well, oh, that's. Oh no, I knew you, but yeah. oh, someone else too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hi, my name is Lily, and I'm a master student in engineering physics. Uh, and my main interest here is uh, within deep learning and neural networks and. Uh, Applicable image analysis. Okay, cool. And is are you interested in image analysis, deep learning as well? Yeah. Okay, so maybe you guys, if you get along, maybe you work. You could possibly work together. And you know what I would like personally, for example, is I, I don't want you guys to think like I'm your instructor, whatever that means. I'm not going to instruct you. Right? I am going to do some instruction, so we're all on the same page. But deep learning for me, I have actually not been able to finish this Udacity course I was doing last winter. I watched lots of YouTube and it's lazy. But uh, I did do a couple of modules and I know the theory. Um, so I would like to actually learn more about deep learning from the projects you're doing, for example. Right? And we can kind of play together, basically. Right? That's, um, yeah. uh, I'm Dimitris. I'm a master's in bioinformatics. Uh, I have a background in computer science and I'm working as a programmer. And I guess I'm more like technology enthusiast, so that's, that's the main reason. Cool. Um, cool. Um, so I'm Ivan, I'm the IPHD of the, the IT department in Network Analysis, and I also recently started working with the <coughs> and so on. Okay. So deep learning is like big fad now in computer science, right? Like, it's just good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we should take a break. I'm sorry, we're like five minutes over the usual break time, is it? Yeah, yeah. five minutes. So, 15 minute break? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Do you guys want to take a 15 minute break? Oh, yes, we want to take a coffee. Yeah, okay. That's exactly right. what you need to be sure to get a coffee. So. Yeah, so shall, should we shut down the thing now? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. We'll post another link. Uh -huh. We'll post another link for after the break cool. so that we don't have 15 minutes. Okay. Okay.